So I've been doing consulting for four and a half years. Prior to that, I was uh, in the mobile handset space for 14 years, doing a lot of firmware development and hardware security research. Um, and so basically what I'm going to talk about is uh, platform security here. Find the right buttons. So you know, you've got your server, it's attached to the internet. The threat model is, is very fairly clear. Um, you have an attacker who's remote. They, they can run scripts, they download, it's very cheap. Their, their attacks scale very, very well. Um, and as we get closer to the system, uh, you know, we start to look at local attacks. So you know, I might have to pay to get like a USB stick installed on your machine. I might have to co-locate my, my attacker VM with my, the, the victim VM, et cetera. Uh, it's a little bit higher cost. Uh, doesn't scale quite as well, more targeted. Uh, and as we dive deeper into the system, we, we start to draw the, the threat boundaries around individual components on the circuit board uh, rather than around the whole system. And, and at, at this level, these protocols are, are terrible. There's almost no security, there's no authentication, there's no encryption, no integrity protection, et cetera. Um, and this is where most of my talk is going to concentrate because this is where I see a lot of our customers struggling. Um, and of course, we can go deeper uh, we can, uh, into the system and we can do things like invasive silicon attacks and fault injection, side channels, et cetera. Um, but when we're talking about commercial off-the-shelf servers and platforms, uh, almost none of this applies. Uh, if you're making smart cards and phones, things where, where physical threats have always been part of the threat model, you know, lost and stolen devices, et cetera, um, then this is kind of where you want to be setting your security bar, like even a decade ago. Uh, but, but commodity servers are not there yet. Uh, so why do we care? Uh, and, and the previous talk kind of gave us a hint uh, about this. Uh, you know, we, we care about this because we're no longer putting servers in, in an environment where it's behind locked doors, you know, have armed guards and cameras and other security controls to, to help protect those servers. We're starting to deploy servers in, in other people's data centers. Uh, it might be as part of your edge network in, in some remote ISP. Uh, you know, in some countries, ISPs are all run by the government. Brazil, for example, uh, you don't want the Brazilian government having your TLS certificates and being able to, to uh, emulate your, your website, for example. Uh, hy hypervisor escapes that allow access to the firmware. Uh, now if I can get persistent malware on your machine, then if I switch from one tenant to another, uh, I can still attack that other tenant, and that's a big problem. If you're running bare metal cloud systems where access to the firmware is kind of a given, how do you repurpose that machine from one tenant to another and still know that the underlying firmware is in a known good state? Uh, and, and of course, supply chain attacks. What happens if, if those servers have been compromised before you ever deploy them into your data centers? And that's uh, a, a big concern that we're seeing a lot more of uh, with recent media publicity. Um, so fundamentally, if you've got secrets in your machine, the hardware attacker will always win. They'll always find a way to extract them at some cost. Uh, and so this is kind of the trap of security nihilism. If, if they'll always win, why, why do I care? Why bother? Uh, and what, what I want to convince people of is that there's a huge difference between some bored high school student who's just going to run some script over the internet and, and some university researcher who's got access to a focus ion beam. There's a, there's a huge cost difference. And so what you want to do is elevate the cost of the attack so that you can eliminate huge numbers of these attackers. And kind of how high up this pyramid you want your products to climb is really uh, a business decision for, for you, know, you and your products. And I've kind of crossed off TPMs. So smart cards were they were born in the 90s during the uh, satellite TV hacking, and as a result, they're, they've evolved to be very robust. It's a, it's a strong piece of silicon that's very hard to attack. Secure elements, TPMs, they're, they're kind of the same uh, technology. Um, but TPMs are really difficult to integrate into a system without enabling very low-cost circuit-level attacks. And a colleague of mine, uh, Jeremy uh, Boone, spoke about his tool TPM Genie uh, last year here, and, and so we know that those are basically no good. Uh, HSMs are more about compliance, and the more we look into them, the more we find that they're not actually as secure as they claim. Um, but really, you want to be up near the top of this pyramid, of course. <clears throat> so back to your server, you've got it attached to a network, probably two networks, because we're talking about you know, data center equipment, you've got a management network as well. Um, don't put that on the internet, by the way. Uh, the management network should be internal. Um, inside your server, it's a, it's a much more complicated story. And I assure you, when you look at a real server, it's far more complicated than this. I, tr I tried to be gentle here. Um, but, but you've got you know, fans and power supplies, you've got network and storage controllers, uh, management controllers, etc. There's a whole lot of systems in here, aside from like the big x86 cores that, uh, that we all know and love. So in this green box, this is, this is kind of the software stack that we're all very familiar with, like the hypervisor and your OS and all your application stack. The yellow star, that's your, your core asset you're trying to protect. It might be a customer database running in your cloud environment or whatnot. And, and so how do we get from where the attacker is to where that yellow star is? 
Uh, and so basically what we need to recognize is that all of these systems here are running firmware. These are all individual computers doing their thing. Uh, and all of them, of course, are attackable. And you know, they have attack surface that can be reached uh, either remotely or locally or you know, physically. And so what happens if those things are compromised? <coughs> and so there's, there's this great quote. Uh, which applies to servers even more so than PCs, because servers are far, are, are far more complex, and so they have more of these embedded systems in them. So there's this design philosophy, which, which I like, where as you get more and more privileged in your system, you have a smaller and smaller attack surface. Uh, you know, so you don't, you don't run your web browser in your kernel. That would be like suicide. Um, and so you, you kind of get lower and lower in your system until you get to the point where you're at these, these low-level you know, BIOS and firmware bits where you, you have something that's much more privileged. And so it's, it's fundamentally trusted to not compromise any of the overlying system. Um, where we run into problems, of course, is that this isn't really the whole story. So, Further down, we've got all of these other firmware bits, which are even more privileged, um, but the attack surface actually increases now. So, you know, when we get down here, you get this like this troublesome hourglass, I call it. Um, and this, this, this happens for a number of reasons. Uh, and one of them is that most of the firmware down at this level is actually written by hardware developers, and not software developers. I don't, want, I don't want to disparage the hardware developers, but their motivations and security expectations are a bit different. They're primarily motivated by selling chips. So they make enough firmware to make the chip go, and then they sell you the chips. And the, the firmware is kind of delivered to the OEMs as, as like a reference. And so they're expecting the OEM is going to take that uh, firmware reference and then re-implement it on their own and then, you know, then ship it. Um, but of course, the OEMs are also under time pressures to get their, their boxes to market, uh, and so they just ship it as is. And so you have this really complex uh, supply chain here. Um, the, the lead time on some of these parts is like 10 years. So by the time they hit the market, they're already old. Things like privilege separation, address randomization, you know, depth. Th th these are like technologies that we've had forever at the top of this, this diagram, but like at the bottom, they just don't exist. These concepts are totally foreign to them. So, and so I kind of hinted at the complexity of the ecosystem here. Um, you know, at any given server, you've got dozens of companies that are involved in the firmware, uh, at least one per chip, probably more. Um, and it's just, it's kind of turtles all the way down, as they say, where you've got so many different companies involved and kind of who owns the security problem once you do have one. Um, when you start talking about provisioning of keys and, you know, the PKI pri providers and TPMs, you know, they might be provisioning keys on every device and that's great, but, you know, have, has that key been recorded in a database somewhere? You know, what if it's leaked? You, you just don't know. You don't have any control over these third-party companies. So, at NCC Group, we do a lot of uh, security assessments and my team specifically focuses on hardware and embedded systems. So, when we look at servers, we're kind of looking at them from the bottom up, not the top down, which is kind of the more traditional approach. So, most of the rest of this talk is about some of these common threads, the common issues that we see our clients struggling with. And then, you know, of course, by extension, I, I think a lot of people in the room might find some of it interesting. Um, at the bottom, you've got a lot of silicon issues. And I'm not going to dwell on this because the last two years has kind of been a wild ride uh, of security research. Uh, and all this is like very brand new stuff. Um, you know, with the Spectre and Meltdown and all of the subsequent uh, side channel stuff that people have found, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really excellent work. Um, but I don't have any solutions to this just yet, so I'm not going to concentrate on that. Um, but it does underscore the importance of, of reading the documentation. Um, all of your, your chip vendors are going to be providing errata, just like your software vendor would. Uh, and so just as an example, not to pick on anyone, this is a selection of, of ARM core processors. Uh, and each of them comes in a bunch of different versions, uh, revisions. And this one here that I've highlighted specifically, there's this bug where you can execute a, sequence, a short sequence of instructions that'll cause a fault and then set the supervisor flag. So you can just escalate from user mode to kernel with just a sequence of instructions. And you know, by all objective measures, this is like a really bad bug, but it's fully documented. Uh, with AMD and ARM, it's, or sorry, with AMD and Intel, it's a little harder to get hold of the errata because I think you need an NDA. I haven't seen many of them, but you should be asking for these things. If you're building servers and you're not getting this documentation, you, you, you have a bad contract. You should have a hard discussion with them. Uh, so in the silicon also, we've got lots of debug functionality. And when people talk about JTAG, they most often think about software debug, you know, setting breakpoints, reading memory, and that sort of thing. Um, but that's not the whole story here either. Uh, JTAG was actually created for, for manufacturing test. It gives you this feature called boundary scan, which effectively gives you direct access to all of the pins on the chip. And you can use that in the factory to uh, tell if your chip is connected to all of the other chips on the circuit board that it needs to be uh, connected to. Um, 
And internally in the chip, you get this DFT, designed for test. Something like up to 30% of the logic inside the chip is, is there for testing the chip to make sure it works. And none of that is documented. That's all done by the chip vendor. Um, it's super invasive, super privileged, uh, and super undocumented, which is kind of terrifying. So when we talk about disabling JTAG, typically that means there's like a fuse to disable it. Um, and, and what we see is that almost always means just disabling the debug functionality. Uh, boundary scan, I've never seen a microcontroller or an SOC that lets you disable boundary scan. And like I said, DFT is not documented at all, so I have no idea what's going on there. Uh, if they've enabled any kind of authentication on it, which is very rare, it's almost always uh, like a fixed password or key. Uh, so you have this kind of break once, break everywhere design philosophy, which is not great. <coughs> So higher up still, uh, at the circuit level, uh, we have all sorts of some neat physical overrides, uh, you know, dip switches, test points, jumpers, etc. And most of these are designed for like a, an administrator to recover uh, a failing machine. Um, and there's an example here taken from audio guy's going to kill me. Um, so this example is taken from the HP documentation and you can flip a couple of dip switches so anyone with small fingers can get in there and just disable the security of, of the, the BMC. Um, so that's not great. Uh, unauthenticated debug, of course, um, UARTs and JTAG, et cetera, um, which often give root shells or UEFI shells and things like that. Um, Anti-tamper mechanisms are almost always not very good. Uh, when we're looking at anti-tamper, that really just increases the cost of developing an exploit, but almost never increases the cost of executing an exploit. So, you know, if you can afford to buy one machine and sacrifice it, then you can run your exploit uh, much, much easier the second time around. Um, and TPM Genia, as I mentioned, is a, effectively a proof of concept uh, interposer. It sits between the TPM and the host processor, allows you to manipulate all the traffic and bypass all of the security functionality of a TPM. And it's really just one ex example of a broader class of attack where you've got some unprotected uh, data bus on your circuit board. Uh, and it's, you know, it was never part of the threat model where someone can get in there and, and muck the, the traffic. So higher still at the firmware level, um, and there's a whole host of issues that can go wrong with firmware, and I've kind of highlighted a bunch here um, that we see commonly. So configuration, when you build a, a device, a board, whatever, you, you have to provision your, your microcontrollers and your SOCs, and normally this involves burning some fuses or setting some, some boot mode pins and things like that. And there's a couple places this has to be done, sometimes at the, the chip fab, sometimes later at, at uh, the board manufacturing. Um, and sometimes later when you deploy it, you might have some you know, persistent memory where you can store settings, like your bias settings and things like that. And, and what we find often is that either those configurations aren't in the most secure state or they're, they are, but they're, they're still writable and so someone else can override them. Uh, the IOMMU is a, a security feature that prevents a lot of DMA attacks over the PCIe bus. Uh, and it basically is not used very often. Uh, on Linux, I think you can configure it, but it's not out of the box, so I've never seen anyone do it in practice. I hear the latest Windows 10 has this sorted, but the pre-boot environment is not. Um, Apple, I don't know about, but it's, it's basically one of these. Apple does it, e even in the pre-boot? That's good to hear. Um, so ChipSec is an awesome tool. It'll, it'll audit a lot of the configuration on your servers. Um, but the reality is it doesn't support AMD or ARM processors yet, and we see a lot of ARM processors on, the, on these embedded microcontrollers. Um, I do know of a couple people who are porting these actively, but that's not available yet, so it's not useful. And, and even so, most people aren't using it, because every time I'm on an x86 job, I run this tool and I still find issues uh, in the configuration. So it's not as ubiquitous as, as it should be. <laughs> Um, programmatic bypasses of these security features exist for like a bunch of totally legitimate reasons. Um, but where we get into problems is where they're poorly authenticated. Either they have weak authentication or just none at all. Um, a good system will usually have some sort of signed debug token that has to be on the system in order to downgrade the security. Um, but we see this done just poorly uh, quite frequently. Uh, one quick, yeah. was, um, who made the comment about Apple? Could we get it on the mic? The gentleman with the hat. Just saying Apple does uh, IOMMU in EFI since around 2016, I guess it is. 2012 for Mac OS, 2016 for firmware. Cool, I will update my slides. Um, so most of the firmware is written in C, and so you have all of your classic classes of, of input validation memory corruption concerns. Um, you know, if you're not checking your length arguments, then you can get buffer overruns. If you're storing addresses or offsets in external flash memory and not validating that correctly when you read it back in, it might have been uh, modified. Um, 
Type confusion is a fun one, especially image type confusion. You could have, uh, if, you, if you're like a company building firmware for a bunch of different products and you have multiple product lines, but you're using the same signing key across all of them, then that gives the attacker an opportunity to mix and match firmware images. But a lot of this stems from kind of a general lack of, of understanding about what is an input. Obviously, if you get data from some user land application, that's untrusted user input. That's, that's a problem. But what about like reading values from a temperature sensor on the motherboard? You know, what about shared coprocessor registers? Um, one of the biggest problems we see is when you have two ends of a protocol implemented by one developer, uh, and naturally they trust themselves, so they make a lot of assumptions about what the other end of that protocol is doing. Uh, and of course, as an attacker, if I can get on that connection between them, I can violate a lot of those assumptions. So um, we see this quite often. If you've got a protocol like that, it's, it's best to have different groups or different people implement each end so they can, they can think through this adversarial model. So back to this server architecture diagram, what I want people to stop doing is drawing the threat boundary around the whole system like this, and instead draw around the individual um, embedded systems within that system, because that's what I see when I look at you know, any kind of big 19-inch server board. And so again, like all of this is written in C, so these memory safety issues, generally it's a uh, you have to ask the question, you know, where does the data come from and where does it go? What does it do? Uh, the where does it come from is your input validation problem. Where, where does it go is, you know, can I make use of this as an attacker? And that almost always comes down to some sort of rogue assignment or a mem copy. Um, but we have, there's lots of other things that are like mem copies that, that aren't called mem copy. Things like uh, other bus masters like DMA engines or GPUs, coprocessors, et cetera. Thing, things that I could coerce other parts of the system to do for me. Uh, and those behave just like mem copies, but things like static analysis aren't likely to find them unless you've created careful rules for your sta static analyzer to identify all of these extra operations, because some of those might be totally external to your software. Uh, memory aliasing, you have sometimes uh, the same physical memory appears multiple times in your address space. Uh, and, and if they have different access permissions, then I might be able to write to that memory by going through one address, but then you know, manipulate the values at the other address where I don't have permissions. Uh, and sometimes we can cause this maliciously by like grounding an address line or something and, and forcing data to appear somewhere else. Uh, race conditions are harder to spot usually. Um, generally, anytime you've got some sort of shared resource, uh, it's, it's gonna be some kind of problem. You need, you need interlocks on that. Um, and one thing that we, we encounter a lot when we're like doing like a readout to a client, and they're like, wow, it's a race condition, it's really hard to exploit, it's, you gotta get it between these two instructions. But the thing is, the x86, which is the least privileged thing in the system, actually is running many orders of magnitude faster, and so winning that race isn't that hard. Um, and one example of a race condition that we do see quite a lot is, is when you're doing your boot up uh, and you're reading your, your firmware from flash memory uh, and you read it once, you verify it, and now you know it's good. And now every subsequent read from that flash memory you just implicitly trust. Uh, so Tremel Hudson, he, he showed that you could bypass the Windows boot guard uh, by doing exactly this, because it was reading it twice, but only verifying it on the first try. Um, anything with an execute in place memory or with demand paging is almost always vulnerable to this sort of scenario. <laughs> So to exploit something like this, here's a device that I had built once. Um, it's basically a cheap $20 FPGA. It kind of sits on the SPI bus between the victim board and its original flash memory. Uh, and I wait for you know, whatever the trigger condition happens to be, and then this multiplexer will then swap it over to this payload uh, block RAM, which I've got in there. Um, and the idea is that I wait till after the, all the validation has been done, and then I swap in my payload so that it'll happily run that uh, on the victim board. Um, so mitigating this is just a matter of either reading it just once or validating it every time, which can be a little bit of a performance problem, but you just kind of need to plan ahead. So this fused depredy problem, it's, it's best illustrated by an example. Like, let's say you've got some kind of coprocessor that's doing operations on behalf of the x86, and it verifies that you, know, you pass it in some memory address range, and it says, yes, that memory is owned by the x86. Fine, I'm gonna do this operation but it doesn't do any kind of checks to make sure that it was this particular process or this particular guest VM that owns that memory. And so as a result, you could uh, have some user mode program on the x86, ask the coprocessor to overwrite kernel memory or SMM or hypervisor or whatever. Uh, and we've seen a number of issues like this where those sorts of protections aren't, aren't extended to, to these other coprocessors. And most, most architectures have some kind of notion of like a, an address space ID or VM ID or there's a bunch of different uh, terminology depending on the, the architecture. Uh, and basically what that is, it's a way to tag an address space as belonging to a particular security context. And 
there's three things that kind of need to happen here. One, the OS and hypervisor need to be setting these flags. Two, that data needs to be propagated out through, through all of the different places where that is going to be used. And then three, of course, the firmware on the coprocessor needs to actually enforce it. Uh, and we've seen that break down at any or all of those three spots. Secure boot is kind of like, how do you get your firmware bootstrapped up from, from power off to running known good code? Uh, and there's a whole bunch of different ways. I'm not gonna go through all of the ways that we've seen this breakdown. Um, but these are just some of the more common ones here. Um, but I'm, I'm gonna touch on just a couple of them here. So this is your kind of secure boot process. You've got some internal ROM, it loads the bootloader, uh, which then loads the, the, some other secondary loader or whatever, and then the firmware uh, does firmware things. Uh, and this whole sequence is kind of predicated on the fact you've got these public keys that you can use to validate the signature of each, of each stage. Um, and importantly, you've got this first stage, which is immutable. It's, it's gonna be like write protected or locked or somehow, so it can't be overwritten. And one of the, we call that a trust anchor or a root of trust. Uh, and, and generally you might have you know, multiple keys for different purposes. You maybe have a different one for recovery key, et cetera. But these need to be baked into the ROM. Or the, usually the code is in the ROM, the key, and the key is gonna be in some kind of fuses because you don't know as a, as a chip vendor wh which key that your OEM is gonna to wanna to use, for example. So you give them the flexibility of programming that public key into fuses. Um, and, but that once it's set, it can't be changed. And that's, that's useful because now an attacker can't go in and change it. Um, we have seen some with the devices where they'll store it in flash, and that can be done as long as you get the access controls correct, uh, which is a whole other problem. So it's not as nice because most of the cheap microcontrollers have really poor access controls on those. Um, but importantly, you don't want it to be an external component, like an external TPM. And that's like things like TPM Genie will, will be able to defeat you. Um, if it's not, make sure it's not a writable component. Um, Cisco recently had a, an issue earlier this year where they had uh, the root of trust was baked into an FPGA but the FPGA configuration was overridable, so someone could just go in and, and change that. Um, and also importantly, you wanna have each chip have its own trust anchor. You don't wanna be reliant on some external trust anchor that's accessible over some insecure data bus. So this is one specific example where I find this issue about once a year, so I think it's worth highlighting. Um, we have uh, essentially some download buffer, maybe it's used on boot or during flashing or whatever, uh, and you upload your, your image. This image is statically linked usually, uh, so it's gonna run at a particular address, it has a valid signature, everything is fine. So where we run into problems is if the attacker can control the load address. So there might be some metadata that's not part of the signature that says where to load this, or you know, if it's over like a USB flashing tool, you might say, here, load my image to this address, and then you give it a valid signed image. So it's gonna load it at the attacker's specified address. And that's fine as long as it's not a, sorry, if it was a position independent piece of code, that'd be fine, but because it's statically linked, you get this problem where it'll execute normally until it hits the first absolute branch instruction. If it's just relative branch instructions, it'll just you know, branch around within itself and it's fine. But once it hits an absolute branch, it'll jump back to where the linker thinks it should be. Uh, and so now you're, you're jumping off into who knows what. And if the attacker can load their payload there, then, then they're gonna win. Um, and like I said, I see this at least once a year on some various secure boot solution. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a common problem. <clears throat> so supply chain, uh, kind of we talked about a bit. This is kind of the problem of how do, you, uh, how do you build secure devices in factories you don't trust really. Now supply chain is kind of a loaded term and depending on who you're talking to, it means different things. But I think for this audience, we're just mostly concerned about number four, which is like really, how do I build a secure product uh, in a factory that I don't trust? Um, and I'll kind of, there's some additional articles that I've written over the years on this topic, which is a whole other discussion, but um, it's best kind of illustrated by a few examples. So by now, I'm sure everyone's seen um, Bloomberg, they accused the Chinese government of backdooring a bunch of servers in supermicro factories, and those were destined for like high profile US targets. Um, it's been a, like a year and there, there's been no further evidence. Um, in the wake of this, this story, uh, I'm sure that many, many people have been looking at their servers very, very closely, and still we haven't seen any public evidence. So whether or not it happened is anybody's guess, but we've also seen a bunch of proof of concepts, a bunch, a bunch of researchers and whatever have put together actual proof of concepts to show yes, this is 100% possible. Um, so I mean, there's definitely more security due diligence. And the question that people should be asking is when I'm designing a server, you know, if someone were to try and perpetrate something like this, would I catch it? And can I design the server in a way where, where yes, they can catch this? Um, and so that's kind of the mentality that you need to be uh, thinking when you're, when you're building your servers. Um, second example, this is even more recent. Uh, Google, they made these uh, two-factor authentication tokens and they were Bluetooth enabled. And what people found is that there's a, 
there's a default test key in the Bluetooth spec that says, you know, if you want to test your Bluetooth device, use this test key. And on these actual products, that test key was like hard coded in there. So anyone who knows that or could read it off the web um, will be able to connect to these devices and use them on your behalf. And so Google and Fishin did a, a huge product recall. Uh, the problem here was that Google kind of contracted this out entirely. So they didn't design it and they had no control over the manufacturing process and the testing process. And so, you know, because they didn't have any of that control, they didn't know what they were getting. And, you know, someone discovered this problem. Um, incidentally, it wasn't just Google's product that had the problem. All of Fishin's products were recalled. Um, so it was kind of a, a bigger deal than it was the news led on. So, uh, third example, this, this is a box you could buy back in like 2003. Um, this was for unlocking your phone, so you can remove the subsidy lock uh, on your phone. Um, and back in 2003, I was at BlackBerry, and we were vulnerable to this thing. This thing could un unlock our phones, and we're like, well, how does this happen? So we bought one, we tore it apart, and inside we found a verbatim copy of our own internal factory test tools. And at that time, we weren't outsourcing to any third-party contract manufacturing. We were doing all of that in-house. So it was our own employees that leaked these tools to the internet. And then someone repackaged it and made this cool little box that unlocks your phone. And we're like, great. So you know, subsequently, we had to put all kinds of controls in place to make sure that those tools weren't usable if you weren't on our network and all these other things. And it, it kind of started my long road into like supply chain security. Um, but the lesson here, of course, is that you need to build your products in a way that if, if something like this does happen, it's not a problem for you. Those tools, you can't treat them as a secret because you're giving them out to your factory and their job is to cut as many corners as possible so they can build as many widgets as they can. Uh, and so they will find ways to reduce cost and cut those corners, especially security ones. Um, so I'm not gonna go through all of the ways that you can detect this. I wrote a big white paper back in like 2015 that discusses it, that QR code is a link to it. Um, but just wanna highlight the first line here, which kind of gives it a glimpse into the data analytics problem. The number of devices that you ordered from the factory, the number they built, the number they shipped, and the number that your customers subsequently activated are, are very tightly correlated numbers. Uh, and so if you're looking at all of the data and you're seeing that there's some wild discrepancies, like you know they, they built twice as many boxes as they shipped, then maybe they're actually selling boxes to somebody else using your design. Or maybe you know, they're getting counterfeit components. And there's all kinds of shenanigans that can go on in the factory. Um, too many to talk about here, just in the interest of time. Um, so ownership, who owns your servers? This is kind of a complicated question. And really what we're talking about is control, like, like the cryptographic ownership. Who's signing your firmware? Who's programming your endorsement keys and that sort of thing. Um, and I don't have any really good answers for this, um, but one of the things that uh, the people who are building secure systems are doing is they're provisioning these things and they're onboarding them or birthing or what, everyone calls it something different. But basically, where do you put those, those public keys? How, at what point in your process do you install those on the machine? Uh, and you can do this at, at the silicon fab, you can do this in your OEM facility, you could do this when you deploy them. Uh, and, all, and all of these are good answers. And in fact, the ones who are doing it best are doing it some combination thereof, so you don't have all your eggs in one basket. Um, and of course, how do you transfer ownership? Like when you sell a server from one supplier to another, do they replace your key? Do they add their key? Uh, and can the attacker do that as well? And so you have this kind of authentication mechanism usually where you can't just install that key without signing it with the previous key and things like that. Um, and there's, I mean, there's lots of different solutions here and it really depends on your whole deployment model, uh, which one you, you choose. And so some final thoughts. Um, I want people to start with better threat models. Understand that your servers are not necessarily going to be deployed the way you think they are. Uh, so you need to understand that full set of threat models and build to the wider uh, use case so that you know, you're, you're providing the best value to all of your, your server customers. Um, starting with better security requirements is, is definitely important. Both NIST and the Open Compute Group have published guidelines on this. The, those two documents are excellent. They're not, um, they're not requirements per se, they're not very prescriptive, but they definitely are a good guiding starting point for creating requirements. And so I highly recommend those. Um, a better route of trust, don't have just one per, per circuit board, you need one per component on that circuit board and it should be inside each of those chips. So they, don't, they shouldn't have implicit trust in each other until you know, they've been verified. And most importantly, you need to push these costs upstream. You need to de demand that your suppliers, whether they're selling you servers or whether they're selling you chips that go in your servers, um, you need to put these requirements into the actual contracts. If your security people get brought to the table after the deal's been signed, uh, it's an uphill battle all the way. Um, an example of this years ago, we, we started demanding better security requirements for, for our, our smartphone chips, and we wanted to provision the keys in the silicon fab. Qualcomm, who we had a deal with over a decade, it took them two years to implement. TI, who we didn't have a contract signed yet, they did it in a month. Uh, and that's just because they, they were motivated to get the deal signed, and so they just did it. Um, and so that's the kind of difference that it can make by having that in the contract. 
And that's it. I apologize for the pace. I didn't realize it was only a half hour slot, so I edited it down. I also speak fast. Any questions? Don't make me tell jokes. I didn't prepare jokes. <laughs> Try to. Uh, I found your point particularly interesting about a general lack of attack surface enumeration, like all these firmware volumes that that were clearly written without careful thought to what is an input. You know, we spend all this time trying to make sure that oh, all the static regions are verified, but then they parse an incredible amount of you know mm -hmm. data with Seco that clearly didn't expect it to be malicious. And I just wonder if you're aware of. Anything other than a very manual brute force, you know, way to go through and you know try to clean that so up. So by the time that our customers bring us in, it, it's it's at the point where it's a manual effort. Um, like in a previous life, we did a lot of static analysis, and tuning those static analysis tools uh, to find these kinds of security issues is kind of a full time job. And I think we had like four or five people on that team that were doing nothing but that full time. Um, but like I said, what, by the time we get brought in, it's usually towards the end. Like, hey, we want to sell this to this company, and they're demanding a third party audit. And so then we come in, and you know, they didn't start from the requirements phase with security in mind. They weren't enumerating all of those attack services. They just kind of, like they were mostly, like I said, hardware developers who were motivated to make the chip work and then sell it. So um, I don't know if that answers your question or dodges it. But. It's hard. <laughs> it's hard. Yes. Um, on that note, there in the Tionicor ecosystem for UEFI, there's actually a toolkit called Hostbase Firmware Analysis that allows you to run off-the-shelf fuzzers like Peach or AFL on individual PEI or DXE components while you're doing code development. Uh, so, because fuzzing firmware is hard from within the firmware, mm -hmm. so there are some methods for doing that outside. So you can you're not going to check it functionally, but you're going to check to see if it does the garbage input rejection or yeah. does static analysis code coverage. So yeah, and that's great. Th for those the, things do exist now, and that's great for UEFI. But I'm I'm more interested in all of the underlying firmware that's running on all of those other microcontrollers in your server, which is kind of a, a much more widespread issue. How many statistics? How many developers use such tools? Um, Right now, no, because it's open source. I think not too much, actually. <laughs> so just to, for the audience, just to repeat the question, the, the question was uh, if there's any statistics on how many people are using that, and the answer was not very many. There, there are not, because it's a newer tool. It was only introduced in April, uh, and it's open source, so we know how many people pull from the repo. We don't know how many people yeah. use it. Uh, Host-based firmware analysis. It's no value. Um, it was used within Intel before it was released, um, so and, that, and that's a great yeah. start. Like, yeah. if, if the vendors of these of these firmware components are using them, then you're at least starting from a somewhat secure spot. What we're finding is that so many of the vendors' board support packages and whatnot just they didn't start that way, and so it's it's up to the OEM to then try and fix their vendors' problems, and that's that's why I want you to get this in the contracts. So supply chain supply chain is actually a little harder than what you represented because you not only have to be concerned about the, all of the things that you mentioned, but a device can be modified in transit. And so you have to design so that as under the assumption that the modification can occur anywhere mm -hmm. between the point of manufacture and the point of delivery. And you have to figure out how you're going to detect, prevent, and get a get, detect, either detect and therefore remove at delivery or prevent. Have you guys looked at that? So we've seen a number of solutions where they'll, they'll assume that devices were compromised before they get them, and they'll pave every flash chip on the on the system with like a known good image when they receive them. It's just part of their, their bring up procedure in the data center, uh, and that that's that's okay. Um, but as long as they're getting all of them, and the problem we find is that you know they did everything on the motherboard, but then they missed all the network controllers or the hard drive controllers and things like that. So yeah, I mean there's kind of solutions, but the other thing is that where do they get those known good ones? They just copied them off of like the first port they got, and then just reproduced that. Um, but what if the first one was compromised? Uh, 
Yeah, it, it is a hard problem. We have uh, seen also uh, companies that are putting uh, like tamper-proof shipping containers and things like that. And of course, there's ways to defeat those. Um, w one of the systems that we used to ship, we used to ship at Powered. Um, this years ago at BlackBerry, is one of our subsidiaries that we bought Certicom, and they were shipping HSM appliances. Uh, and they would power them on, provision them, and then they would ship them. And they had these um, like vibration sensors and other things in there to say, like, is somebody drilling through the case to try and get into this? And during shipping, those vibration sensors would be triggered. Uh, so when they arrived, they were DOA. Uh, and so, I mean, it's not an easy problem, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, you, you really have to change the architecture of the processor to really get to it. And only a few people have done that. Yeah, yeah, and, and most of the people who are building boxes don't have the power to directly influence the, the silicon design. So you need to start with secure components. A couple over here. Uh, this is a question on the topic of host-based firmware analysis. Have, has, have you, Rob, or anybody else in the room looked into firmware auditing uh, through full system emulation, like QMU or Unicorn or... So I have seen emulation used uh, to fuzz small modules, but fuzzing a, a whole firmware, you, you kind of have to re-implement the whole hardware in emulation. And that's, unless you're building the hardware, you don't have the design insight to do so usually. As a, as a black box project, you, the best you can hope for is to extract some function from the firmware and emulate just that. Uh, and I have seen that done, uh, not really at scale though. I don't know if anyone else has a better answer. Um, I had a question about the threat model you're creating where each coprocessor module had its own trust boundary. Mm -hmm. When a client comes and asks you to validate the security of their machine or their board like that, how do you validate each coprocessor module when it's a different vendor for the firmware? Um, you don't have so, access. Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. Um, and typically it's when we're doing it for, like, say, the server OEM, it'll be like a black box job. But we'll, we'll pull off the firmware from each component and try and do some analysis. It's, it's, it's usually not too, too in-depth uh, because there is a significant amount of effort involved in reverse engineering. Uh, but if we do find anything, any bad smells, typically what they do is they push that upstream and they say, look, we found these bugs in your code. You know, you, you go get a third-party audit and have this checked. And so, I mean, that's, that's part of the organic growth that we do. But um, generally, if you can push it up the, the, the costs uphill, then it's not your fault. And more and you can you like get, get the vendor to, to fix their problems uh, and then we can do like white box assessment where we can go much deeper find variants that sort of thing can you go back to your um hourglass diagram for a second sorry which one hourglass oh. yeah so i think it's tempting to basically you said you know all the firmware below the bios is you know, equivalently or more powerful and stuff like that. I think a lot of times these other firmwares, like, yeah, sure, you know, PSP, CSME, they are more powerful. But like on your uh, block diagram, when you're saying the NIC or the USB controller mm -hmm. or whatever, those are not strictly more powerful than the main processors. So like just, so you also made the recommendation of, well, each of those individual processors must have its own independent uh, secure root. And then, you know, then they subsequently each have their own storage, that kind of thing. Um, a lot of times those things, if you've got a NIC card, if the NIC is used in the, the main x86 firmware, it's equivalently powerful then as it is to when an OS is running. So like its interface into the x86 is the same in either case. And so it's not any particular more powerful. And so like design paradigm, you can either try to make that thing independent and secure itself or a lot of vendors, uh, a bunch of third-party vendors that make stuff, all these little miscellaneous peripheral firmwares, they have modes where the thing runs as just a pure slave to the main thing. It just comes up and reset. It says, send me my brains. It gets sent brains. And then whether it's an OS sending it brains or firmware sending brains, you don't say that it is, needs its own security root of trust. It is just a part of the main security root of trust. So, yeah, like, I mean, and this diagram obviously is glossing over a lot of details. Um, but I, I think what a point I was getting at is that like a lot of these devices, like your network card is on the PCIe bus. And so, you know, assuming your IOMMU is not configured properly, which in many cases it's not, then it does have significant access to your memory. And so it can do those sorts of things. Um, but, but things like your power supply is running a microcontroller for it because it's hot swappable. Uh, we have seen uh, at least one exploit where you can actually get control of the BMC through that interface, for example. And that, but that's a chain of vulnerabilities. Um, and so it's not like you know, one isolated uh, vulnerability is going to defeat the whole system. But yeah, your, your point is, is valid. There, there's a lot more nuance here. That right. I like this 
this particular view for lay people, but the majority of people here are not lay people. So this is good yeah. for just coming in consulting, but I would just make the assertion of for security architects, the one thing they can consider, especially like I kind of want to show of hands, how many people here like can influence the hardware of their own platforms versus you just buying off the shelf components? Because like influence hardware, because I know, you know, Microsoft people can influence their own hardware, Intel people, Apple people. Like but like some half. of you, if you can't influence the hardware, then sure, it's just completely independent. You do yeah. whatever they give you. Yeah, I kind of assumed a mixed audience, but yeah, that's a valid point. Uh, a quick, quick question while the mic's changing. Uh, you mentioned contracts. Uh, you mentioned contracts. Yeah. Um, are there, do you think it's a possibility to have sort of best practice open source reference contracts for the supply chain that could bootstrap people? That's, that's an interesting problem. Um, there's so much variability in legal teams amongst companies that I'm not sure it would work, but, but providing that is not something that would be very large effort. I think, you know, for example, like, the, like NIST and Open Compute Group are publishing those uh, hardware security guidance. Uh, for more security guidance documents, those, those are an excellent place to include something like that. Um, yeah, I might suggest that to them. It's, it's more to help uh, people who hire lawyers negotiate better with those lawyers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because frequently the security team's just not brought in to the negotiating table. I mean, they're, they're, you know, cost per part and you know, performance are bigger concerns. And by the time you get to security, it's already signed. More questions? Thank you.